Greetings to you, our beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. It is indeed a privilege for me to fellowship and to share God's Word with you through this video. Will you join me in prayer before we begin? Father God, we worship you. We glorify you. We offer our lives to you. We declare you are sovereign above all things. You are in absolute control of everything, and nothing in this universe is outside your sovereign will. All glory to you alone, our Father God. In the midst of this pandemic, we implore you to protect and preserve your people from the deadly COVID-19 virus. As many of us here in our country, and as well as millions of people around the world, are now facing the challenge of reopening important businesses and commerce and many major segments of our country's labor sector are going back to work to save our economy from virtual collapse but even as we face this big challenge father we know nothing is hidden from you and because we know you love us and you know what's best for our people we can put our full trust and full dependence on you because you are fully trustworthy. We can rest on the fact that those who love you and for those who are called according to your purpose, all things work together for good. Great is your faithfulness, our Heavenly Father. We thank you, dear Holy Spirit, for your indwelling presence to those who are in Christ Jesus. As we feast together in your word in the spirit of worship, we pray for wisdom and understanding. I pray that I may only speak in such a way that you will bring what is needed to be accomplished on everyone who hears it. I am truly grateful for this privilege, O oh Lord. Lord Jesus, we thank you for saving us. We thank you that by your sacrifice on the cross, you have opened the way for us, those who have put our faith in you, that you have taken us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of light, to be heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Thank you that you have done all this for the glory of your name, and all this we pray to you, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now come to our expository study of the Beatitudes, the distinguishing mark of a Christian. And as we have looked at the general introduction to our sermon series last week, we say some general standards of understanding. Number one, we said the Beatitudes are a description of what a Christian is meant to be. It is not a description of just a few people, not, not just a description of exemplary leaders. All Christians are to be like this. The beatitude is not describing an office, office or a function or anything like that. It describes the character, the character of a true believer. We also say that all Christians are meant to manifest all of these characteristics. Not, not only that this beatitude is meant to be for all Christians, but all Christians are meant to exhibit, to manifest all of them in their lives. And as we will find out, as we analyze its beatitude, as we uh, go on for the next week and today, each one of them by necessity implies the other. But most importantly, we also say that None of these descriptions refers 
to what we may call a natural tendency. You see, no man naturally conforms to the description given in the Beatitudes. And so we must be very careful to, to make a very distinct demarcation line between the spiritual qualities that are described here and the material qualities which appear some, for some people to be naturally like these Beatitudes, um, even, if, even though they are not believers. The characteristics in the Beatitudes are not natural qualities. Hindi po ito natural na lalabas sa isang tao. Nobody, nobody by birth and by nature is like this. But even though no one is naturally born with these characteristics and no one by their own strength and abilities can be like this, we give all glory and thanks to God because all Christians, every one of us, you and me, whatever we may be by birth or by nature, is meant as a Christian to be like this. And not only we are meant to be like this, we can be like this. Praise the, praise the Lord. And so we shall now consider the first one, the first beatitude. It says in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Brothers and sisters, this is the first ever pronouncement of the Lord Jesus Christ as he begins his ministry on earth. And we know that the Lord Jesus did not indiscriminately or arbitrarily decide from among the Beatitudes which he would select as the first. Blessed are the poor in his spirit for theirs and only theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Lord put this first because it is the foundation of everything else that follows. There is no one, may I say that again, there is no one in the kingdom of God who is not poor in spirit. Do you see the implication of that? Unless we are poor in spirit, we don't have a chance of being in heaven. And while you remember that we said last week that the beatitude is really a whole and, not, and cannot be divided, for example, you cannot be poor in spirit and be a peacemaker. Or you can be a pure in heart and not mourned. That is not what it really meant. Because beatitudes is a manifestation of a Christian character, the Lord Jesus makes it a point to start from being poor in spirit. For without it, all the others won't follow. Do you get that? What it really means is that there must be an emptying first. Being poor in spirit connotes there must be a process of emptying first while the other beatitudes are a manifestation of fullness. It's the same thing as the Apostle Paul is teaching in the book of Colossians. In Ephesians, there's must, there must be a putting off and a putting on. And the Lord Jesus is saying we cannot be filled unless we are empty. Hindi po ba? One writer said there are two sides to the gospel, really. There is putting or pulling down and raising up. We would remember the prophet Simeon when the Lord Jesus Christ was taken as an infant to the temple to be dedicated by his parents. Simeon, when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ as he lifted up the infant in his arms, he said, Behold, this child is appointed to the fall and rising of many in Israel. It is an essential part of the gospel that conviction must always precede conversion. The gospel of Christ condemns before it cleanses. 
It is the short version of the doctrine of justification, really. This statement, being poor in spirit, is really a justification. No one in his own strength can merit salvation. No one goes to heaven by doing good works. And, has, and nothing or no one has nothing at all to contribute by his, to his salvation. It is only by faith and the, it, given, it is given only by grace, only by Christ. And so, in order for us to be clear about this text, being poor in spirit, let us, let us see what it does not mean. Okay? First, it does not mean, it does not refer to assumption of voluntary poverty. Uh, this is what most Catholics, our friends in the Catholic religion, interpret this verse. That's why they look at St. Francis of Assisi as the patron saint of the poor because he, he voluntarily abrogates his wealth. He is a rich man and as a family and he turned his back from wealth and he voluntarily assumed poverty. It is also the error of um, people who are monks, who, who goes to monastery. They, they completely abdicated what seemed to be of the flesh, material wealth or anything like that, and succumbed to poverty. But that is not what the Lord means here. It does not assume voluntary poverty. Okay? Poverty is not a requirement. It doesn't absolutely um, uh, gives way to uh, salvation. Alright? Also, it does not mean a change in personality. As it is generally something purely fleshly and carnal, it is a matter of uh, personal appearance and a guise of humility. Look, um, when you are truly a Christian, you don't have to work hard in trying to be humble. All right? So, what does it mean? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Brothers and sisters, it means a complete absence of pride, a complete absence of self-assurance, a complete absence of self Reliance. It is demonstrated by the Old Testament saints. I can give you some examples of that. When Isaiah be beheld the glory of God, when he saw the glorious shining light of God, he saw himself and he said, Woe is me, I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. That's how Isaiah looked at himself in the presence of the glory of God. It is the same attitude of Gideon when God told him that he will give victory over the people of Israel and he will lead them to victory over the Midianites. Gideon said in Judges 6, he felt so inadequate and exclaimed to God, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. It is the same sense of nothingness that Moses felt when God told him that he was he will lead the deliverance of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. He will be God's champion to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. This is his words. Who am I that I, that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And just to give us a hint of how God considered the humility of Moses, this is what he said, I will be with you. This is the same characteristics demonstrated by the New Testament saints, such as Peter. Peter, we know, is too confident of himself for his own good. 
He is quick to speak before he even thinks. But after being restored from his stubbornness, he admonishes the Christians. Look at what he said in 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. He also said in 1 Peter 3, 8, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Imagine that. This hot-tempered Peter, when he was restored by God, turned into the humble mind, humble heart that he has. A true Christian does not believe, he does not believe in or rely upon his natural position in life or any powers that he may have been given to him. He does not rely upon money or any wealth he may have. He does not boast on the high education he may receive or any particular school or college he may have been. There must be a complete deliverance an absence of all of that. In fact, the Apostle Paul, with all his achievements, his education, his knowledge, his intelligence, came to regard all of that as rubbish. Or in some versions, it is like dung. All right? He said, But whatever gain I had, I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Brothers and sisters, that is what is meant by being poor in spirit. It is poverty in spirit. It is to feel we are nothing and that we have nothing and that we look to God in utter submission to Him and in utter dependence upon Him and His grace and His mercy. But perhaps there is no one who has perfectly exemplified this better than the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. He repeatedly said, I can do nothing of myself. All right, this is the God man speaking these words. Our Redeemer, the perfect Savior of the world, the one who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth, said this The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. The Lord repeatedly says this, I can do nothing. I am utterly dependent upon Him. That is it. Even as we look at His prayer life, we see the Lord Jesus Christ's character as we watch Him praying. And we realize the hours He spent in prayer depending on God the Father. And you see His poverty of His spirit and His reliance upon God. Being poor in spirit is a consciousness that we are nothing in the presence of God. Nothing that we can produce. It is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves. It is just this tremendous awareness of our utter nothingness as we come face to face with God. And as we examine ourselves against this beatitude, perhaps the question we should ask is this. Am I like? Am I like that? Am I poor in spirit? How do I really feel about myself as I think of myself in terms of God and in the presence of God? How do we become poor in spirit? Well, as we have observed, as I have mentioned earlier, we can be poor in spirit and be like the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints. And most of all, by reading the Word of God, 
looking up to Jesus, we will be poor in spirit. You see, we cannot truly look at the Lord Jesus Christ without feeling your absolute poverty in spirit. So we now consider the second beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This verse, like the first, stands out immediately and marks off the Christian as being unlike the man who is not a Christian. The world would regard a statement like this as absolutely ridiculous. Happy are those who mourn. The one thing that the world tries to turn away is mourning. It is the whole philosophy of the world. The world's pleasure, the money, all the energy, and all the enthusiasm that are spent in entertaining people, they are all an expression of the great aim of the world to get away from this idea, this spirit of mourning. This is something that we should avoid, according to the world. Forget your troubles. Turn your back upon them. Things are bad enough as they are without going to look for troubles. Be happy. Just be happy as you can. But the gospel says, happy are those who mourn. They are the only ones who are happy. And if you turn to the parallel passage in Luke 6, we will find it being said in a more striking manner because it is said in the negative. It says in Luke 6, 25, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ seems to be condemning the apparent laughter, fun, and cheerfulness of the world by saying, woe to it. And he promises blessing and happiness, joy and peace to those who mourn. Once more, we can see that it is clear from the verse that here, something which is entirely spiritual in its meaning. Our Lord did not say that those who mourn in a natural sense, those who are sorrowful because of a death of someone, that they are happy. No, he is not referring to that kind of mourning. This is a spiritual mourning. As we saw that poverty of spirit is not something financial. It is something essentially spiritual. It has nothing to do with our natural life in this world. All the Beatitudes have reference to a spiritual condition and to a spiritual attitude. So, what exactly does the Lord mean when he said, Blessed are those who mourn? Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones explained it this way, To mourn is something that follows of necessity from being poor in spirit. Again, it is quite inevitable. One leads to an expression of the other. As we confront God in His holiness, as I contemplate the life that I am meant to live, I see myself in utter helplessness and hopelessness. I discover my, my quality of spirit and I immediately uh, mourn because of that. You see, I must mourn about the fact that I am like that. Obviously, it does not stop there. A man who truly faces himself and examines himself in his life is a man who must of necessity mourn for his sins. Also, but for the things he does. As we have started our study of the Beatitudes, we have recommended self-examination. True spiritual persons are recommend, recommending that we practice it. They practice it themselves. They say it is good. It's a good thing for every man to pause at the end of the day and before he lies his bed, his, his um, head to the bed, to, the, to uh, his, his bed and meditate upon himself, he runs quickly over his life and asks, what have I done? What have I said? 
What have I thought? How must I have behaved with respect to others? Now, if you do that often enough in the evening before you sleep, you will find that you, will, you have done things which you should not have done. You said things which you should not have said. You will be conscious of having harbored thoughts and ideas and feelings which are quite unworthy. As we realize these things, any man who at all who is at all a Christian is smitten with sense of grief, and he is sorrowful that he was ever capable of such things, in action or in thought, and that makes him mourn. But he does not stop there. He does not stop merely at the things he has done. He meditates upon and contemplates his action and his state and condition of sinfulness. And as he does examine himself, he goes through the same dilemma that Paul in his um, maturity has, has in Romans 7. You see, he must be aware of these evil principles that are within him. He must ask himself, what? What is it in me that makes me behave like that? Why should I be irritable? Why should I have bad temper? Why am I not able to control myself? Who do I harbor that unkind, jealous, and envious thought? What is it in me? Paul asked that, that question in Romans 7. And like, like us, we discover this war in our natural being and we hate it and mourn because of it. It is quite inevitable, my brothers and sisters. And this is not an imagination. This is true for every Christian. And if you object to this kind of teaching, it just means that you do not mourn and therefore you are not one of the people who our, our Lord says are blessed. If you regard this as nothing, if you think it is morbid to even think about it, something a man should not do, then you are simply proclaiming the fact that you are not spiritual and that you are unlike the Apostle Paul and all the saints and you are actually contradicting the teachings of the Lord Jesus himself. But brothers and sisters, you and I know that mourning over sinful nature, over our bad behavior, is an actual experience and true to those of us who are truly Christians. But then again, we do not stop at this point. Because otherwise, the description of the Christian is going to be an incomplete one. Our Lord Jesus said in these Beatitudes, it makes a complete statement, it must be taken as such. He said, blessed are they that mourn, those who mourn. And he said, for they shall be comforted. The man who mourns is really happy. That is a paradox, really, right? In what respect is he happy? Well, he becomes happy in a personal sense. The man who truly mourns because of his sinful state and condition is a man who is going to repent. The fact that he is mourning is already an indication that he is already repenting. The man who truly repents as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit upon him is a man who is certain to be led to the Lord Jesus Christ. Having seen his utter sinfulness and hopelessness, just like the Apostle Paul, he looks for a Savior. He cannot do it himself. He is utter, utterly hopeless. No one can truly know him as his personal Savior and Redeemer unless he has first of all known what it is to mourn. It is only the man who cries out, Oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from all of this? That man can also turn back, just like Paul, and say, I thank God 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, this is something that follows as sure as night and day. It is inevitable. If we truly mourn, we shall rejoice, we shall be made happy, we shall be comforted. For when it is, for it is when a man sees himself in an unutterable hopelessness that the Holy Spirit reveals unto him the Lord Jesus, who is his perfect satisfaction. Through the Spirit, he sees that Christ has died for his sin, and he is in standing at, as his advocate in the presence of God. He sees Christ, the perfect provision that God has made, and ultimately, immediately, he is comforted. That is the astounding thing about the Christian life. Your great sorrow leads to joy. And without the sorrow, there is no joy. Now take note of this point. This is not only true at the point of conversion, just like what we said last time. It is something that continues to be true about the Christians or, or anyone who has believed in Jesus Christ. He finds himself guilty of sin, and then he casts down himself because of that. It makes him mourn, but that in turn drives him back to Christ. And the moment he goes back to Christ, he, his peace and happiness return and he is comforted. So here is something that is fulfilled at once. The man who mourns truly is comforted and he is happy. And this, the Christian life is spent in this way, mourning and joy, sorrow, and happiness, and the one should lead to another immediately. But there is not only this immediate comfort offered to the Christian. There is another comfort that which we may call the blessed hope, the happy hope, which the Apostle Paul elaborately discussed in Romans chapter 8, verse 21 to 24 that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have first fruits of the Spirit, groans inward, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. In other words, as the Christian looks at the word of the world, all this pandemic around us, and even as we look at ourselves, we feel unhappy. We feel unhappy. We groan in spirit. We know something of a burden of sin, a sin in the world which was felt by the apostle, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself, we, he sees that. But then we are immediately comforted. We know there is a glory coming. We know that a day will dawn when Christ will return. And, a, and, and sin will be banished from the earth. There will be new heavens and new earth wherein righteousness dwells forever and ever, the blessed hope. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. But as we reflect on this beatitude, we should ask the question, what hope has a man who does not believe these things? What hope has the man who does not have Christ? If we look at our world, look at what is happening around us, where can you put your hope upon? There is no comfort for the world now. But for the Christian who mourns because of sin, because of what's happening in the state of the world, there is comfort. The comfort of the blessed hope, the glory that yet 
remains. So that even here, though he is groaning, he is happy at the same time because of the hope that is set before him. There is that ultimate hope of eternity. And in that eternal state, we shall be holy and entirely blessed, truly happy. There will be nothing to destroy or spoil life. Sighing and sorrow shall be no more. All tears shall be wiped away, and we shall bask forever and ever in the eternal sunshine, in the experience of being blessed and being happy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So in summary, let us define what sort of man is he who is poor in his spirit? This man who mourns. What sort of man is he? We can say he is a sorrowful man. But he is not a miserable man. He is a serious man, but he is not cold-hearted. A true Christian is never a man who has to put on an appearance of either sadness or cheerfulness. He is a man who looks at life seriously. But in his sober-mindedness, he has a definite understanding of truth. He also has a joy unspeakable and full of glory. He is like the Apostle Paul, groaning within himself, and yet happy because of his experience of Christ and the glory that has to come. The Christian is not superficial in any sense. He is fundamentally serious and he is fundamentally happy. The joy of the Christian is a holy joy. It is a serious happiness and joy. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ himself, groaning and weeping, and yet for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Here is a man who is poor in his spirit. But when he was given and, and, and taught about the doctrine of sin, he immediately feels the crushing of that weight of sinfulness over his shoulders, and he immediately feel, feels a sense of mourning in his whole being. But at the same time, realizing his true position in Christ, he truly repents of his sin, acknowledges his nothingness before the Lord, recognizing that apart from the perfect atonement of Jesus Christ, apart from the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, and in his utter, utter helplessness, ask for forgiveness and truly receiving God's spiritual cleansing by his mercy and grace. And then he receives comfort, real joy of knowing he is an heir to the kingdom of heaven. That, beloved brothers and sisters, is what a Christian is and what he is meant to be. God bless us all.